we both meet at this Maui mastermind hosted by our friend Brandon Turner. Which truly was probably the biggest pivot, just being around people that were thinking so much bigger than me. Yeah, so what do you think you learned at that mastermind? I became a real estate investor for time freedom, but I wasn't able to do that with how I built my business. So actually stepping out of that and starting to hire a team and actually start to build systems. We have been focusing a little bit more on the, instead of making 30,000, you make 3 million. It's like, okay, let's do that instead. Like what have you seen as like tips for those listening who are trying to find lenders and things for their deals? I think being really awesome. Today, we have a very special boss lady in the house. None other than, as she's known on Instagram, Investor girl, Britt. What's up? That's right. Thanks for having me, Ryan. Yeah. So it's really cool to uh, see you in Vegas. Yeah. It's fun to be here. You said you were just stopping in yeah. to then go to Boise. Yeah, exactly. And then you stopped by the studio. Yeah. Just hopping in, hopping out. I'm like, hey, Ryan, do you have a quick minute? Let's do a podcast. <laughs> yeah. So I'm I'm excited about it. Um, You know, I'll let you kind of tell the story, but, uh, you know, we've met, when did we meet? Probably 2019. Yeah, I three think. years ago. And then we ran into each other in Mexico, super <laughs> random. And, uh, True. you know, now we're working with a lot of the same people and different businesses. So it's just really cool. Mm-hmm. Our paths keep crossing. But um, for those who don't know you, why don't you give them a quick rundown? Yeah. So, Investor Girl Brit, I guess people know me now in the real estate world, which is fun. And do, do they even know you by your normal name? <laughs> they have no idea. No. Yeah. Brittany Arneson. Huh? Yeah, nobody, nobody will knows. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what's been fun because I have built this brand up for myself through social media and really just showing what I was doing. So right. really the hands-on stuff got my pages going and all that. But have been a real estate investor now for over 10 years and just building it up. Yeah. So you're from Canada. From Canada. And all your investments were mainly in Canada? Yeah. So built my portfolio, mostly single families. And then I uh, bought an apartment building. And that's when the f- switch really flipped to commercial real estate. Because I thought, okay, that's way easier and way quicker and more scalable than the single family side. So I switched to that. But now I own um, self-storage facilities in the U.S. So building up that portfolio here too, as well. So what's the portfolio look like today? Um, well, 10 self-storage facilities that I'm a, a co yeah, partner GB on. on. Yep. So I'll have that and then just picking them up because there's so much opportunity in this space right now. So we're really um, doing a lot with that. And yep. then I still own almost all of my stuff in Canada as well. How many houses is that? Uh, 27. 27 houses yeah. in Canada. And if I'm not mistaken, didn't you renovate like all of them? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that was it. My DIY skills. <laughs> yeah. So for those of you who don't know who haven't seen Brit online, like the first time I met you, mm. you know, you still working away. Yeah, you were like <laughs> showing all these videos of you building all these things. Like you were putting countertops on. Mm. You were like building walls and just like all this crazy stuff. I'm like, do you fix up all your own homes? <laughs> and you're like, yeah, you know, I'll kind of like go live there for a little bit and fix them up and. Like, what the heck is going on here? (laughs) Well, that's true. And I'd go and live in the properties and fix them up as I was going along. And it was, it was a lot of work, but I was just always willing to put in those sacrifices for that long-term vision. How many years were you doing that? Uh, I guess seven years. So did you even have like a home that you lived in or you always just bounced around house to house? Bounced around. Yeah. That's crazy. (laughs) And I also had a van. So I had a 1995 Ford work van and I would sleep in that and then renovate the house. And when they're, and it's cold in Canada. Yeah. So sometimes yeah. it was, you know, you just it was a layer up. Exactly. But, That's crazy. So you just bounce around house to house. And did you ever, when you were renovating, did you renovate the whole thing or did you ever hire people out to do some, some things? Sometimes it would be higher. It just depend on, depended on the house, it, how much it really needed. But I would do a lot of the work. And if it was cosmetic, I'd definitely just get all that done. But So where did you learn your skills? Well, my mom owned rental properties. So when I was growing up, I'd help her out with painting and things like that. But she didn't have a lot of money. One of her friends uh, had a tenant in the basement suite. And she realized that, okay, if I do this, I can pay off my mortgage and live for free. Mm-hmm. So, but she didn't really know what she was doing. And she's like, hey, kids, how about I pay you a dollar every Friday to help me renovate this property and right. basement suite? So I learned a little bit doing that. But then, really, the best way to learn is just jumping in and 
and getting it done. But honestly, a lot of YouTube and Instagrammers and I would message people say, hey, I'm working on this project, putting up this brick wall. Like, what's the best advice you have? People are extremely helpful if you're willing to put in the work and actually take that advice. So you would post to kind of get your audience engaged and be like, hey, you're going to help me do this house. Yeah. I would do that a lot. And at the beginning, I didn't really have Instagram right off the start, but a few years in, that's when I started posting on online and building up that, yeah. that platform. So you were already like developing your skills as <laughs> essentially a contractor. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and you're doing this on your own. Like at what point did you decide that, hey, this is probably worth filming? Uh, well, I had a mentor. I met a mentor at a real estate conference and he said, you have to do something that's going to build up your credibility, credibility as an investor. And he suggested starting a newsletter. And so I started writing this newsletter and like trying to get people's emails and send it out that way. And then I realized, okay, this isn't really my thing. Writing, yeah. I didn't like it that much. So I found Instagram and I wasn't even really on Instagram before at all. But photos, videos, that's more my style. So I got on Instagram and just started posting like, hey, I found these cheap kitchen cabinets at Habitat for Humanity. Like, this is what I paid. And then I started posting a little bit more that way. But I knew I had to do something to build up my credibility and show what I was working on to get investors and things like that in the future. Right. Well, and I think it was interesting is like, you know, you were one of the first people to really start that I saw anyways in the real estate space, putting out videos and content, right? Oh, like it's cool. way more popular now, <laughs> yeah. you know, right. with reels and everything else, like everybody's putting out content. Sure. But, you know, I ended up meeting you in 2019 mm -hmm. um, at the Maui Mastermind. And at the time, I think, I don't know how many followers you had on Instagram. Like mm. maybe, Probably less than 100,000. Probably around 100 or yeah, something. something like that. And to get to 100,000 on Instagram back then, mm. The algorithm isn't what it is today where, you know, you can get some viral reels and they'll push you like, no, dude, it was super hard back then. <laughs> it is. How did you go about building the following then? Well, I think it was just consistency and it wasn't easy. Even at the start, it took me a full year and I couldn't figure out how to get to a thousand followers. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, why is this so hard? But then I think it really was just consistency and being vulnerable and actually showing the reality. And then people really could relate to that because they're like, wow, I'm having the same struggles Brit is having and she has this success, right? But then I actually show behind the scenes and actually what was going on. Right. Yeah. And I think just seeing you, you know, fix up these houses and like just getting after it, mm -hmm. you know, and like you, you didn't miss posting, like you were just very consistent mm -hmm. and it, it's just, it was a unique thing. Nobody, first off, let alone being a girl doing all of the construction, which is already rare in itself. Mm -hmm. um, but like guys and stuff weren't even doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was cool seeing just like you were innovating before it was cool for <laughs> reels and TikTok to do, especially like with the time lapses and stuff. Yeah. Well, and that's what I wanted. I wanted to show the entire process and the easiest way, because I was really busy. I was really trying to, and I was doing everything at this point too, like the property management, the bookkeeping and all of it. And then plus trying to film my videos and do the actual projects because I was renovating them for yeah. the house and I right. needed to get it rented out. So I was on a timeline. So I just set up my time-lapse video and just do it, like do what I was doing and then film it. So it was, it was easy it wasn't content. My, it wasn't extra work. It wasn't extra work. I was already doing it. So setting up the camera was easy enough. <laughs> like it's harder for me to say, okay, this is exactly what you do. And I explain, because I always wanted to do that too, get into YouTube and explain how to make a studio like this, you know? Right. But then that was so much extra work it felt like because I would have to explain to the people on the camera and all that. And I didn't feel I had that time, but I mean, I could start doing yeah. a little more of that now, but did the you, time lapse was so easy. Did you think it was just kind of like a different skill set too? kind of like being a host versus like, you didn't really have to talk or anything in yeah. your videos, you know, you're just like doing what you're doing, like you said. <laughs> yeah, I think that's natural for me. I'm just like a kind of get it done person and I'm not used to really having to explain or teach in any sort of way. So, and that's kind of how my mom was too. Even I saw her own rental properties, right? But she never really explained to me what it was. I just saw her doing it and then saw that she was getting rental income every month. And then when I was 18, I bought my first house because mm -hmm. I saw that I didn't quite fully understand it probably until I read like rich dad, poor dad or something like yeah, that yeah. and started doing courses in real estate 
going to seminars and things like that. But I really saw my mom doing it and actually working super hard when I was a kid. So that really was ingrained in me. Yeah. Super cool. So, um, you know, time goes on, you start, you know, developing a following, you're buying more rentals, you're fixing them up. And then, um, you know, 2019, we, we both meet at this Maui mastermind hosted by our friend, Brandon Turner. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think there's maybe like 20 of us or so at that original one and a lot of great people that um, still stay in touch with to this day. I, I think most people actually stay in touch from that now. Let's pause real quick. We just launched something new that I'm really excited about, which is our text hotline. It is now easier than ever to get in touch with myself and my team. If you've ever been thinking about working with us in any way, whether it's through real estate investing, learning how to create content or scaling your business, we want to help you out. And it's super simple. All you gotta do is just text 725-444-5244. If you text that number, my team is gonna get in touch with you right away. And I, in fact, might be responding to some of those texts as we get the system just built out and rolling. We can answer any of your questions for getting you help, telling you about our different programs, different events we've got coming up, different resources that we have that can help you. It's gonna be epic. So just text us at 725 444 five, two, four, four, and somebody will respond to you and get you help right now. What, um, I guess got you invited there. How did you, who did you know? Brandon. So okay. through Instagram too, because what I was doing on Instagram, all these people that I look up to, cause I listen to the bigger pockets podcast all the time when I was doing my renovations. Yeah. And so I'd hear all these tips and, and things from Brandon and Josh and David. And then I would share it on Instagram stories, be like, Hey guys, I heard this great tip on the podcast this week. And then I'd tag Brandon and then he took notice of that. And then eventually we became friends through Instagram, which was really cool. Uh -huh. And then invited me to this mastermind, which truly was probably the biggest pivot for me. Like one of the biggest pivots I've ever had was attending that mastermind and just being around people that were thinking so much bigger than me. Yeah. So what do you think you learned at that mastermind? Well, oh, so much really. And it was getting out of my own way. Cause I was so comfortable in doing the DIY renovations. And I was like, this is just what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to do forever. I love renovating. I love being hands-on, which is true. And I love projects and being creative, but then I tied myself and really built myself this job that I couldn't get <laughs> out of. It's yeah. like, why would I do that? That's not why I became a real estate investor. I became a real estate investor for time freedom and to be able to leave when I wanted to, but I wasn't able to do that with how I built my business. Right. So actually stepping out of that and starting to hire a team and actually start to build systems, that's what was a huge difference maker for me. And something you said too, I remember, because I said I was so overwhelmed and I was working so hard. And you said, when I get overwhelmed, I delegate. And I thought that was such a good point. It was just like blew my mind. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I could maybe start doing that, you know, and it's just a simple thing. But then when you actually think about delegating instead of just doing it, because that's what I was used to doing. Okay. I need to do this. I'm just going to get it done. But now it's like, like the book, Who Not How mm -hmm. by Dan Sullivan. I love yeah, that book. Great like, book. Because- now it is, you just start to think differently. Okay. Not how am I going to do this? Who am I going to get to help me to do this? Yeah. No, hundred percent. I, and I actually remember saying that because yeah. <laughs> there was a lot of people who were like, dude, I'm struggling with being overwhelmed. I got too much work going on. Yeah. And you know, people ask me today all the time. They're like, dude, how do you manage all these businesses and stuff and not get overwhelmed? And my answer today is still the same as it was, you know, three plus years ago when I didn't even have all this going on. I was just like, Hey, you know, Whenever I start feeling overwhelmed, I actually like it because it's a signal to me that it means I need to hire somebody. Mm -hmm. Because if I'm feeling like, oh man, I have so much on my plate and so much to do, it doesn't mean like that's a bad thing. It means like that's good. Business should have a lot going on if you're, you know, producing a lot of revenue and sales and things. So it's just an indicator to me, like, man, why do I feel this way? Well, it's because I'm doing this, 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 this. I, you know, and I know I have all this other stuff that still needs to get done. Mm -hmm. And it's like, why do I have to be the one to do it all? Yeah. Am I like the only person in the world that knows how to fix a toilet? Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like, no, lots of people can do what I do. Exactly. And I think it might be a control thing with people. It's like, you feel safe because you're in control and all of that. But then once you really start to get used to it and get in that habit of taking it off your plate, it just makes 
life so much better. I so think. much better. So much better. You so, want to have time for golfing and your babies and things like that. I know. <laughs> I was just golfing this morning, you know? I want to <laughs> run into random people I haven't seen in a long time in Mexico, you know? <laughs> <That's> so true. <laughs> so... Yeah, you know, we, we met there and you actually probably were a bigger catalyst. And I don't ever tell this story um, much about my social media career, but this was actually the very beginning of what kind of got me on the journey of social media. You know, I talk about how during COVID, you know, I looked at everything. I said, man, where's the world going? And it kind of became apparent to me that social media was huge. I was like, okay, YouTube's going to be really big. TikTok's going to be really big. I need to go all in on these. But what happened about six months before that was meeting you. And I remember, you know, in the mastermind, we had a little breakout groups and you and I were in a group and, you know, basically I don't remember what I said or the question I had, but you were, you said basically, Hey, I think you could make really good content and you could grow your following really fast if you just focused on it. Mm -hmm. And at the time I didn't care. I was just like, yeah, you know, I'm really good at doing business. That's what I want to do. And you're like, yeah, but I think if you just focused on social media, it would really help your business. That would take you to the next level. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to do it. Like, I, You've grown your following. I'm just going to go out after this mastermind and I'm going to hire a videographer and start taking content seriously. Mm -hmm. And so um, my videographer, Sion, was the first person I hired. You know, I made a post on Instagram. I said, hey, yeah, I'm looking for a videographer here in Vegas. If anyone's interested, hit me up. So he hits me up. Um, and I'm like, I don't really know what we're doing, but, uh, <laughs> just film me and like, I'll, I'll come up with stuff to say, mm. you know, we'll, we'll do like how to stuff and we'll walk around some of my deals and whatever. Right. And so I did that for a couple of months with him, but only for Instagram, mm. you know, I didn't do it for YouTube. I wasn't even aware of TikTok. and then, um, COVID hit. So then him and I stopped filming cause we couldn't even see each other for a little bit. And then, um, by the time I realized during the lockdown that I wanted to actually do it seriously, I realized my mind kind of switched. I said, you know what? I think Instagram's not what I should focus on. I think I should focus on YouTube and TikTok because that's where like the long term is. And then um, it ended up being good. And then Instagram finally changed their algorithm where it was like, hey, you know, we'll promote you if you post, you know, reels. And so then I was like, oh, Instagram's cool again. <laughs> yeah. But um, all that is to say, it's not like I just all of a sudden day one, you know, during COVID was like, yeah, social media is great. I had already been kind of thinking that and trying to experiment with it six months prior from what you said. And it does, it takes that time to build it up and then, but you did such a good job with it. And then it was just like, you're everywhere. And it was just <laughs> like, yes, I love it. And the different hair. I'm like, I need to start doing something with my hair. And like, yeah. What, what color are you thinking? I don't know. Maybe bright pink. Pink is good. Yeah. That might be my next color, actually. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. We'll match. Yeah. And then start a business somehow. Yeah, the pink hair <laughs> duo. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, we we go from that mastermind. Um, I go down this social media path. Um, what what were you doing during COVID? Uh, just the same stuff. <laughs> COVID <laughs> did not change much for me at all, really. Yeah. I mean, it did because after the mastermind, everything changed for me because I just started thinking so much differently. Mm -hmm. And then it was like, okay, a few years later, people that we met at that mastermind are now my partners. Mm -hmm. So AJ Osborne, for example. Yep. So we're partnering on these self-storage facilities and you build these relationships and connections with people and you could see it in the long term too. So I think like that's really important with going to these masterminds and different things like that and actually getting out there and meeting people because you never know what's going to come out of it even two years later. Like there's always connections that could be made. And I think that's so important in real estate. Yeah. No, and AJ and I are doing some stuff together now too. And so it's just like, yeah, a lot of people from that mastermind, we end up crossing paths and then like it leads to some other things. Yeah, exactly. Um, and it only takes really one connection, one idea, one opportunity, and then to change really the course of your life. So it's just like, I think it's so important to get yourself out there like that. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. So, you know, you've kind of transitioned a little bit. You've talked mm -hmm. about how, you know, who, not how, right? Yeah. You're, you're obviously, I don't think you're still fixing up your own homes anymore. Not anymore. I'll do a little project. This kind of stuff is really fun for me, like studios and really the cool backdrops and things like that. Not so I'll renovating. Do, not creative renovating. Creative, just cool stuff. 
So I like to do small projects like that. But other than that, I'm not renovating at all anymore or even buying single family homes. I haven't bought one for, yeah, over three years, I guess now. You're just all in on commercial. Yeah. I love commercial. So what, like, what are you doing these days? How are you spending your time since it used to be only spent renovating? (laughs) Yeah. Well, I guess really building my team. I've spent a lot of time doing that and building up my socials. And then the more I build up my social, the more opportunity I have to get investors in on our deals and do much larger deals than what I could have before. And that's because I do have a team backing me and amazing partners as well. Yeah. So what's your social team look like now? All right. Now I just have one girl, Jade, under me. So she's been awesome and just getting me really (laughs) organized with my content and getting a lot more out there. So we have a schedule and a content calendar. Really how I was running it before was the same morning. I'm like, okay, it's Wednesday. I post every (laughs) Wednesday. So what am I going to post? And I quickly edit my own video. So then Jade's really been helping me a lot with that. And then I have video editors as well. Mostly in the Philippines who who help with the editing and all that. So it's not really a team. Like my social media team is really nothing still, but um, even getting a videographer. And the problem is I think I travel so much that it's hard to, I don't have an office or anything that's like one place. I'm kind of a little bit moving around. So I need someone to just follow me. (laughs) I know. So I got Austin (laughs) with me now, you know, I I just realized I'm like, you know what? I'm just gonna have people follow me and that's the yeah. content. <laughs> Makes you look like a big time celebrity. I know. I'm like, I'm so <laughs> busy. Razzie, please <laughs> <laughs> stay away from me, please, guys. <laughs> um <laughs> yeah. I'm just gonna start taking Austin to like restaurants and stuff. Yeah. And I'm like, guys, stand back, please. <laughs> stand so <back. laughs> so with AJ and everything you guys are doing, I mean, you're raising money for the self storage units and everything else. Um you know, is that the plan going forward? Just kind of make content and, you know, raise money and and just keep doing more and more deals. Yeah, exactly. And I think it's been such a cool way to do it. And even so it probably was maybe six months as well after our Maui mastermind. And I was trying to buy a self storage facility on my own in Canada. Okay. And I was talking to AJ, it was a great deal. Everything was going well. And then AJ said, and I think I was trying to raise capital for this deal as well. It was still a smaller facility, but he said, why don't you put it out there on Instagram that you're looking for partnerships and people to come in on these deals with you? And I said, AJ, you know, I'm a single family person. No one's going to want to partner with me. That's what I thought. That's where my mindset was at that time. Mm -hmm. So I put it out there. Hey, anyone looking to partner on real estate, put your email here. I got 300 emails off of that one Instagram story. So then that got me thinking, okay, there's a lot of interest here, but I just wasn't thinking that way for so long. So then I started to really push it out there and then got tons of emails, started to gather a lot of investors. And then a few years down the line, like I started doing that for a while, which is also why I think everyone should start collecting information and all that and emails, I think specifically right off the bat, because having that data is really important. And then in the future, when you start to do email sequences and all that too, I think it's just great to have because I spent so many years just not collecting any information from my followers or people at all. So yeah, it's funny. They say to, I've heard this um, saying to content creators that, you know, you don't own the platform you're on, right? YouTube could shut you down tomorrow. Instagram could, you know, ban your account, right? But you know, if you own the data, the emails, the phone numbers, everything else, then you own that. Exactly. So yeah, some I've been thinking about too recently is building the email list better. Um, I hired an email guy, you know, about a few months ago. He's been doing great. But um, up to that point, I, I was like you. I wasn't utilizing email at all because I think when you have social media influence, you kind of take it for granted. You're just like, yeah. oh yeah, I'll just post. Yeah. <laughs> It's why, easy yeah, until why your even, Instagram's deleted. And then exactly. it's like, now what do I do? <laughs> yeah, until Instagram doesn't like something you say and now yeah. you don't have one. And it happens. It's oh, yeah, freaky. So you can't really build your business based on that variable too that could could change. Yeah, that's why I've also spent a considerable amount of time building all the platforms, right? It's like I'm True. on TikTok and YouTube and podcast and Instagram. And, you know, I haven't really done LinkedIn too much, but now I'm building my Twitter. Mm. And it's just like, yeah, you know what? I'm aware that one of these could just go south. Yeah. 
it's true. If you haven't heard, WealthCon is coming back to Las Vegas April 18th to the 20th, and I believe it's gonna be our biggest one yet. We're gonna try and fill the Caesars Palace with 2,000 top-level real estate investors and entrepreneurs. I've got amazing speakers like Neil Patel, Tim Grover, Dan Martell, Pace Morby, and many others coming, and it's gonna be great. So if you wanna get tickets today, we got some special deals going on. All you gotta do is text me at 725 444 5244. We'll get you info on what kind of tickets we got all the way from general admission to our diamond level tickets where you're able to network with the speakers, go backstage, ask them questions, and then have a dinner with all of us in a really intimate setting. It's gonna be great. So if you wanna get tickets, text me at 725-444-5244. What do you see, um, you know, I guess, your life evolving into as time goes on? Like, it's interesting that you made all your content DIY. Mm. So like, how do you plan to make content now if you're not doing that? And like, how do you transition into like, yeah, you know, we're, we're raising for, you know, commercial. Well, and that was a really tricky part for me because I did spend so many years in the DIY and the single family space. And then when I started to transition to commercial, it was, it was, tough because I had no idea how the posts were going to do, how it'd be received. But I'm just always trying to provide a lot of value to people and educate them or inspire them. And I found that people have been really inspired by my my story. And I say, hey, guys, I'm building up this team. I'm interested in commercial because it's more scalable and it's more aligned with what I want to do. And people are have been really receptive to it because I was so nervous about it at first. I'm like, I'm going to lose all of my followers. No one's <laughs> going to care. But I have found that people have been really receptive to it. And I think it's because they're following you for because of you and as a person, not necessarily because I know how to renovate a kitchen. Yeah. 100%. And there's a little bit of that. Like I had a little slippage and some followers that aren't following me anymore, of course, because I changed paths, but I mean, that's okay. Yeah, no, hundred percent. So with raising capital, you know, I raise capital from social media very much the same way you do too. Like, what have you seen as like tips for those listening or trying to find lenders and things for their deals? Yeah, I think being really authentic and open and just putting out there exactly what you're doing and why, and then having a great track record. What's been great about having social media is the people who are investing with me now have seen how hard I've been working for the past 10 years and they've been following me for a long time. It's not like one person just sees one post and then they're like, I'm investing with you. And that could be the case too. But I think what's really cool is they have been following me for so long and they've seen me and the operations and me and my network and the people I know. Because if I don't have the answer, you know, I, I could pick up the phone and in a second, the network I have now would be able to answer the question. So I think just showing people uh, really your circles and really showing them your business and all the inside stuff, not keeping anything secret and being really transparent. Yeah. So is there like any specific way that you go about it? Do you like send them to a webinar? Do you just like put them on an email blast? Like how are you going about it? Yeah. It's usually comes from Instagram posts. I'm also on LinkedIn and TikTok and all those places. I don't know yeah. how many people come from TikTok or anything <laughs> else like that, but I actually found LinkedIn because you said that's one of the ones that you've been um, yeah. not sure about the most, but I think LinkedIn, I've gotten a ton of investors from. So really? I really like LinkedIn. Instagram's been great. And usually I'll make a post on all the platforms and then direct them to stories. And then they could sign up for my um, investor form. So they put all their information in there. I want to make sure they're accredited and then we will send them to a webinar. So then We'll do a webinar and then send out email sequences as well. Got it. Yeah, I need to um I need to take LinkedIn more serious. And also too, I need to do some kind of webinar for our investors because I, I just personally just have them fill out a form and you know they invest, but I know we could do way better. So what do you okay. what do you do on LinkedIn? Like what's the posts look like? This is similar to Instagram. So LinkedIn is can be a little bit more. Instagram's almost more fun and then LinkedIn's a little bit more serious yeah. investing stuff. And I find that does the best and a little more informational and all that and detailed. But I mean, it's similar stuff. I post the same picture on my Instagram that I do on LinkedIn. So it's not really that different, but I've just been posting a lot more and getting a lot more interest from investors on that platform. Mm. Yeah. You know what? You're going to like basically spark my interest again three years later where I'm like... <laughs> 
<laughs> webinars. Yeah. <laughs> LinkedIn. <laughs> yeah. And I do webinars for my other businesses, but I just don't really do them for, um, Pineda Capital. And like, I could totally. Yeah. Um, but yeah, man, just thinking about how to go about LinkedIn. It's been very different too. I think it's very similar to Twitter. Twitter's like a more serious audience as well. Yeah. I have a hard time with that. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, cause I'm Twitter not... too is not like video based at all. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just purely writing. Yeah, exactly. Well, are you, did you say you're on Twitter a yeah. lot? Yeah. Okay. Well, I just started Twitter this year. I think I'm close to 10,000 followers. So oh. I'm trying my best, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but when my bread and butter is making videos mm -hmm. and I hate writing now, Yeah. you know, it's like, man, even I've gotten so much worse with writing because I used to be a very good writer mm -hmm. and I wrote my book myself yeah. and I, I would sit down, I'd take the time to write up like a really good post and everything, but I'm so impatient now, especially too, when people are texting me, mm -hmm. like I send voice messages, pretty much everything. Yeah. I love voice messages. Yeah. Now. Cause I'm like, I'm not typing this. Like, let me just, this is way simpler for me. But we don't want to receive them. Are you the same way? I'm like, I'd love to send them, but just like te text me back. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I've actually heard people say that, like where yeah. they get super mad to get a voice message. But <laughs> for me, I'm like, well, That's I send them so many times that I feel <laughs> obligated to listen. <laughs> my so whole, they're... my whole staff. And those who don't, those who have Android, I get pissed at them because oh, yeah. the worst. they won't let me voice message them. <laughs> I know. Not allowed. So, no one working here is allowed to have an Android. <laughs> that's what I tell them. Yeah. And I tell them to put in their two weeks if they do. <laughs> that's it. Yep. So are you interested in um, crypto or anything like that? Oh, I haven't been great in that space. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know that much about it. And then I see you and your NFTs and all this stuff. And I think, okay, I need to get on it. <laughs> yeah. I always like asking all the real estate people that because, yeah. you know, most are in the same boat. They're like, yeah, yeah you know, I'd like to learn more, but I just don't really know a lot. Ah. And I'm like, okay. So we're all saying the same stuff. Everyone's saying the same stuff. And when I keep hearing the same stuff, it means that there's mm. a product. So true. Yep. I, I love that. And that's even what I think when I hear the same thing over and over about people not having a lot of amazing investors, right? And they're so good at, with video and so good with all this, but they don't have time to do that, figure out the editing and figure out the whole process and where to post, what to post. There's tons of investors like that who are super successful. And I just hear that problem all the time, which I'm sure you do yep. too. Yep. But so whenever I hear a problem, that means that there's a business, yeah. right? <laughs> Love that. So there, there's your business. That's your next one. That's the next one. Yeah. We're doing it. So yeah, speaking of that, um, I, I'm curious about Canada because you're mm -hmm. a Canadian citizen, right? Mm -hmm. And so you've come here on visas and different mm -hmm. things. Um, are you going to become a U.S. citizen or what's the path? That's the plan. I'm moving to Vegas. We figured it out this yeah. morning. My suitcase is downstairs. Yep, there we go. <laughs> I always convince everyone to move to Vegas who like, they'll golf with me or some or they'll be on the podcast. I'm like, why do you live there again? They're like, oh, I don't know. I'm like, you should move to Vegas. <laughs> no, it's amazing. Yeah. So... Um, like with Canada, mm -hmm. you, you have all those single families and a lot of people ask me or not ask me, but when they apply at Future Flipper, we actually get a lot of Canadians. Yeah, They're like, sure. Hey, will this work in Canada? And I'm like, yeah, the, the theory and everything else, like the premise of how we do it will work in Canada, right? All the things we're teaching you are relevant, but you know, how you go about the process is going to be a little bit different. Exactly. Like what's different about buying a home in Canada? Well, and this is so funny because I get the same thing all the time because there's a lot of Canadians who are in the really expensive markets like the Toronto or Vancouver. And I was in Calgary and anyone, maybe people would know Banff or I don't know if have you heard of it. It's a big ski snowboard town, but that's uh -uh. where I grew up and it's an extremely expensive area. Okay. And so I moved to kind of like a Midwest vibe, yeah. middle of nowhere because that's where the cheap houses were. And I didn't really... So, I mean, there's a lot of people in Canada who say certain things don't work, but then I'm like, okay, I'm going to make this work. I just have to maybe move. <laughs> but, yeah. and I would listen to all American content. Like I would listen to bigger pockets. And then I just, I really go for the big picture of things though. And the details sort themselves out. Right. So I say, you know, I hear on a podcast, multifamily is a great way to do it. You can scale it. It's recession resist resistant, all these sorts of things. So I go, okay. Let's do it. And then there's certain rules like 1031 exchange, for example. I remember listening to that and 
I think Rich Dad, Poor Dad. That was the first time I heard that. And I'm like, 1031 Exchange, this is amazing. I was so excited about it. And then I realized we (laughs) don't have that in Canada. (laughs) Yeah. But it's fine. Then move on and you still can continue. There's still a lot of very successful real estate investors in Canada. So I just figured out the details really when I went along. And there are different things, but I mean, I don't really pay attention. I'm not great with the details, right? So I'm just kind of like big picture. And then how do we make it work? So that's how I went about it. Well, I'm curious, like, you know, you said Canada has such expensive real estate. I remember seeing that in Winnipeg when I was playing baseball there. It was like, why is real estate so expensive there? So expensive in certain places. And then meanwhile, I'm buying $25,000 houses in the middle of nowhere. Why, Why is Toronto and these places so expensive? I know. Well, there's a lot of foreign investors coming in with a lot of capital. And so they kind of blew up those markets. And then it was hard to... I think like specifically those cities, but then there's a lot of other cities in Canada, but it seems like those are the focus places. So I think it was a lot of foreign capital coming in. Yeah. Because who's like, uh, yeah, I'm just curious because if you're already Canadian, right, Mm -hmm. you live there. And so it's like, okay, you got them, but that wouldn't explain why it's so expensive. Like you'd have to have a lot of money coming in. And so I just think about, I'm like, why do the foreign investors want to go there? Why wouldn't they just go to, the U S and these different major markets. There's probably some other. Like, I just wonder if they have a benefit, if the, if the government has like incentive programs or something like that. There was, and now they're kind of stopping it. And now I don't even really pay attention. Yeah. (laughs) That's the problem. Cause I, I don't, I kind of go in my areas and where it makes sense. And then all the rest of it, I just don't even bother paying attention to because there's so many markets and that's why, you know, even going and investing in the States now, that's where my focus has been. But there's always different ways to do it. And if it doesn't make sense to invest in Vancouver, I'm not going to do that and I'm not going to care. But I I also think there's a lot of people who are successful in those markets too. I just don't exactly know how they're doing it. But yeah. So how, um, how are your, your taxes between the two then? Like, how does that go? That's been a complicated situation. (laughs) (laughs) So that's why we have great tax teams and they've been really working through all of that because it does get complicated between the two countries, but then I just leave it to the people who know what they're doing. And that's what I started doing with the who, not how, right? Cause right. beforehand I'd be like, well, that's too complicated. I'm not going to do that, <laughs> you know? And then just forget the idea. But now it's like, no, okay, who can actually solve this problem and who's going to be able to structure it. And then you get the best in the business and they structure it all for you. And then that's how I get it done. Okay. So, and I own a tax firm, but mm-hmm. You know, I'm not the expert on international, yeah. <laughs> you know, taxes, but it seems to me like if you're not a U.S. citizen, you know, it's like, okay, how do they tax you on stuff that you own in the U.S.? Because you're, I guess, would they just tax you as if you were one? Like, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I'm still trying to figure out all the <laughs> details too. There you go. That's true. Yeah. No, it's crazy. So what do you see as like the future of you know, I guess your content and everything else, like where do you see the world going? I mean, obviously you were on the cutting edge of it five years ago, like doing this for everyone else. Do you think like it's still going to be important in the years to come? Do you still think like everyone's going to do it? So then it becomes like, nobody's doing it. Like, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I think it's always really important and it's changed my life so much. And even just with the connections that I made and the amazing friends and then the circles that you get into, I think there's always people that are going to be online. It is kind of the way the world is going. And now I'm kind of interested in all the businesses you've been doing with (laughs) NFTs and all this kind of crazy stuff, like the online real estate world and how that's all going to look. But it just seems to be the way of the future. So I'm just going to continue creating content and try to figure out what people want to know, what they want to hear about, and then go yeah. off of that. Well, and don't you, um, you do have another business with um, AJ. Don't you guys, you guys are doing education now too, right? Yeah, we do. So REI Circle is our group and that's been going really well. It's just so cool to see the people really creating those partnerships. And we do, we have been focusing a little bit more on the commercial real estate, but we opened it up for everyone. But that's kind of the path that we took because we didn't see a lot of groups out there that were focused specifically on commercial real estate. So we're focusing on that, but then opening it up for everyone. Because I always say you want to think bigger sooner. So you want to start with those ideas, you know, as soon as you get into real estate, because then it's just going to come together that much quicker. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I've realized that too. You know, as a guy who's been in single family for a long time, it's like, man, commercial real estate has some really big deals. Like yeah. these are so cool just to see the numbers and like ways people make money. And I'm like, mm-hmm. man, dude, that guy just flipped that that building and made three million bucks like that. It was nothing. <laughs> it's easy. And the thing is, it, it is the same steps and the same process yeah. to do that. It's not anything different. Yeah. Instead of making 30,000, you make 3 million. It's like, okay, let's do that instead. Yeah. I, I just, my mind was kind of shocked at just how, I guess, you know, even a guy like me, I still have these like false beliefs. You know, yeah. one thing we always try to do with students is break their false beliefs because so many of them come in like, so I don't want to say damaged by like different things, like, mm-hmm. but they, they just have these false beliefs where they're like, Oh man, I don't have enough money. I don't, yeah. you know, there's no way I can do this until I save up. It's like, no, as mm-hmm. you, you're raising money for every deal. We never have enough money. Exactly. Right. Then there'll be people like, Oh, well I can't fix, you know, I don't know how to fix a house. Like, mm-hmm. well, you don't have to, mm-hmm. you know, Oh, the market's too competitive. The market is going to tank. It's like, mm-hmm. these are all just like false beliefs and fears that don't, allow you to move up and like, you know, serve and and grow your business. And it's like, you're always going to have these, there's always a fear that the market could tank tomorrow. Mm -hmm. doesn't matter how good it is. Yeah. It's so true. Yeah. And it's just that fear that does stop most people. And I think that's such a huge part of it is just figuring out what those limiting beliefs are and then saying, and it's hard. Sometimes you do need that conversation or the coaching to get you to that point. Cause I had that as well for so many years. And I thought for one, I'm never going to be a leader. I'm never going to have a team. I don't know how to communicate, blah, blah, blah. I would always say that I would never do an eight figure deal, things like that. I'm like, Nope, that's impossible. That would never happen. And all of these things five years ago that I was telling myself or do a podcast, for example, <laughs> I laughed at the thought of my myself doing a podcast five years ago. I never thought I'd do a podcast, never thought I'd speak on stage, things like that. Yep. And then five years later, these impossible things, now you're doing them and it's not that bad. Yeah, no, hundred percent. And we all have these fears. So yeah, I, I had fears going on camera too and like being judged and mm-hmm. people thinking I suck and all this stuff. Um, but yeah, I had a fear with commercial for a long time where I'm like, yeah, I just don't get it. Yeah. I just don't want it. Like, I, it's too complicated. Well, and you get stuck in that comfort zone, right? Because it's like, okay, single family, you're amazing at it and you're you're doing well and have this business around it. And then it's like this comfortable thing. And then to learn a new thing feels like such a process and so difficult. So that's how, kind of how I felt about it. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. So, you know, I think uh, everybody can just realize like there's lots of different paths to success. I mean, your path was, you know, doing it in Canada, working from a van, yeah. <laughs> 1995 van, living in the houses, like grinding it out. And I think people just like don't even realize mm-hmm. the amount of work you had to put in because mm-hmm. they'll just look at you and be like, oh, she didn't have to do it. Like, <laughs> and it's like, you put in so much more work than anybody else that I can even think of. Like I didn't put in that much work. (laughs) Probably the better way to do it. (laughs) (laughs) But you know, that all of that, like grit and determination made you who you are today. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think for me, like all those years I spent in the minor leagues playing baseball, making 1200 bucks a month, like Mm -hmm. made me who I am today. It was like, yeah, Mm -hmm. I could do that. The rest of this stuff is simple. Yeah. Exactly. And we learn those lessons one way or another, and then you could either grow and, you know, reach a higher potential or you can kind of stay that way. And that could be fine too. Certain people want to stay in uh, one path, but like you and I, we we could feel a higher potential and we wanted to do bigger things. So I think that's where that comes along. Yeah. Speaking of that, what do you think motivates you at this point? That's a good question. And I actually have almost been taking a step back, which is funny because my businesses are doing better than they ever have. But I've actually been taking taking a step back away from work because I realized during all that time and working so hard on the properties and all this and being so obsessed with this financial freedom idea and all this. But then a lot of other things fell behind, right? Like my health and my faith and all of these things. Mm-hmm. And then I started to look at this wheel of life and where are my relationships at, where are all of these other parts of life. And they were really starting to fall behind. And I was so, cause we probably have this obsessive personality where it's okay. We want to 
get this done, be successful and all this stuff. And then everything else falls away. So the last year I've really been focusing on that and actually being a little bit, I don't know if balanced is the right word, but trying to focus on other things rather than just work in real estate. Yeah. So hard for investors to do. It is. It's actually why I created the wealthy way for those of you who've never gone through it. Definitely um, go to wealthyway.com. We got a course for free, a planner for free. Everything's free there just to kind of like help entrepreneurs balance their life better. Cause it's just like, I love that. It's such a common thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and I turned 30 this year and I'm like, okay, <laughs> where, where did I think I was going to be at 30 and where am I right now? Because yeah. maybe it doesn't look exactly the same, but you know, that's what I'm trying to focus on now. Now that I have an amazing team, I have more time to focus on myself and other things that are very important. But yeah, I love it. So I think everyone got a lot of value out of today's episode. Where can um, they continue to follow you? Well, Investor Girl Brit, really everywhere. Not on YouTube yet. Maybe I'll start that next, but. <laughs> yeah. YouTube's a whole different beast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's pretty much it. And then my website is BrittanyArneson.com. Is that how they get on the email list? Mm -hmm. Brittany yeah. Arneson. That's her real name, guys. That's my real name. Nobody <laughs> knows it, but. And I think someone took investorgirlbrit.com. That's why I don't have that. <laughs> <laughs> They're trying to, to sell it to it, you. Yeah. <laughs> That's I shouldn't so have funny. said that. Now it's prices going up. Prices going up. Somebody's <laughs> yeah. taken many of my domains and websites. I had yeah. to pay money to go get my my handle at Ryan Pineda. Oh, so interesting. People are price gouging me. Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> so 